Okay, so last time that we talked about gas chromatography, we discussed this concept of a packed column and a capillary column. And we said back in the early days, we had these packed columns inside of the instrument. And now, after the 1980s, these packed columns have been changed into something more modernized, and these are our capillary columns. So, this is the progression of the gas chromatography system, and we're just really doing an overview for now, and we'll get into the nitty-gritty details a little bit later on in the lecture videos. But you're probably wondering, what on earth is the use of a GC? You know, why would we use it in a laboratory? Why would we even run a sample on it? And the answer is that gas chromatography is very diverse. It can run a number of different types of samples depending on the industry that you are working for. So for instance, we've said that pharmaceutical companies probably will not use a gas chromatography system for a pharmaceutical drug that they're producing. However, if that drug is uh, comes in contact with any type of solvent, with any type of chemical along the way, that solvent or that chemical has to be tested. So very often, they will use gas chromatography in order to test and make sure that these solvents are very pure. So when we say it's not used for pharmaceuticals, it really isn't. These compounds are typically higher molecular weight. These compounds are typically not volatile, but the solvents that you might use in order to make them are. And those are the compounds that get tested on a gas chromatography system. We also talk about quality control of raw materials. So if we talk about quality control, any type of chemical, any type of reagent that comes to me at the laboratory has to be tested before I use it for any purpose whatsoever. And this is part of quality assurance and quality control. So for instance, if my employer was ordering hydrochloric acid that hydrochloric acid has to be tested before I'm able to use it. Now, hydrochloric acid is not suitable for gas chromatography. It's not very volatile. But if I'm using compounds like methylene chloride, or if I'm using compounds like toluene, or any of these aromatics that we'll eventually talk about, these are very well suited for gas chromatography, and those have to be tested for purity. Other things are contaminants in environmental hazards. So we're looking at soil, water, and gas, or air. Uh, a lot of times we want to make sure that the soil that we plant our crops in are clean. The water that we drink is not contaminated. And the air that we breathe is not contaminated. And gas chromatography does a very good job when it concerns the field of what we call PCBs, or polychlorinated biphenyls, dioxins, and pesticides, or herbicides. The PCBs and dioxin family are some of the most notorious compounds that are known to man. Some of the most poisonous compounds are out there are PCBs and dioxins. And very often, if I worked for an environmental laboratory, I would want to make sure that I'm testing for those compounds to make sure that they're not showing up or if they are showing up, that they are in very low amounts. If I worked for the cosmetic industry, maybe I've got a cologne or a perfume uh, sample that I'm working on. Well, those cologne and perfume samples can be easily measured by gas chromatography, right? These things are volatile. They evaporate very easily. That's why you can smell them when people squirt them on their skin. Not only that, but I can also test competitor products, too, to figure out how does the Abercrombie & Fitch Fierce smell so good all day long, and my cologne maybe doesn't do that. So it allows me to get some insight of competitors' products and maybe make my own better. Something else, if I was working for the forensic laboratory, is the blood alcohol content. So if I pull someone over on the side of the road and they fail a drug test or an alcohol test, then I can bring them into the laboratory and I can take a sample of their blood and spin it down and process it. And I can actually inject that sample on the gas chromatography system. 
And this will give me some idea of if the person was really drunk or not, as far as ethanol content goes. And I can even do some drug testing using this process as well. So are these people um, uh, tainted with uh, methamphetamine or cocaine or maybe marijuana? I would be able to detect the presences of those through proper methods using gas chromatography. And finally, gas studies. Uh, very often if I was working for a plant that was producing some type of gas that we were putting into a gas container and selling to someone else, that gas has to be tested. So we often talk about purity of gases, 99.999%, 99.9%. Well, these gases have to be tested a certain way, and we can use gas chromatography in order to do this. Uh, this picture over to the side, uh, this is a picture of a auto sampler tray. So there's some sample down into these little glass vials and there's lids on them. And when you put the sample onto the machine, this piece of rubber up here at the very top will get punctured by a needle that will come down and suck the sample up. Uh, and then the needle will pull out of the vial and then inject it onto the machine. So we're going to see some of these vials and the auto injector and more detail about those a little bit later. Uh, but that's what that picture is supposed to represent. Now before we go any further, I want to kind of share with you a story of what some call the worst disaster of American history that we can remember. Um, and uh, this was a chemical compound uh, that was produced and used uh, during the Vietnam War. So uh, if you go back and, and take a look at these compounds, PCBs and dioxins, uh, we said that these were very potent. They were very dangerous. They're very hazardous to someone's health. And we constantly want to take a look at these. Um, when we look at polychlorinated biphenyl, uh, let's really kind of talk about what that means uh, for maybe some people that haven't had chemistry yet. So if we look at PCB, polychlorinated biphenyl, uh, the C stands for chlorinated, so that's chlorine. So poly means many, right? So we've got many chlorines on a molecule. And the B stands for biphenyl. All right, so the phenyl group typically in chemistry is a ring structure. And bi means two of these. So I probably have two of these ring structures at least. Now it doesn't have to stop at two. What you'll see is some variations of these structures, but it gives us a starting point at least. So these compounds are typically involving two rings, and then on these rings will come off uh, multiple chlorine groups. So let's just say that these have four chlorines onto the structure. And there's probably a connector piece in here in the middle. That connector piece can change as well. Now, it doesn't have to fit this template every single time, but this gives us a starting point at least when we talk about polychlorinated biphenyls. All right, so back in the uh, Vietnam War, we see a number of different dioxins, which again are just a class of compounds that are very toxic, that was used for a specific purpose. Down here at the bottom, you see some of these variations. Uh, these are all uh, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls. And if you look really close in this very first structure, you'll see two rings. They're connected by another ring with two oxygens. But this says chlorine with a small n down below. And that just means a number of different ones. It can be one, two, three, four, who knows. But there are multiple chlorines on each of these rings. Here's another example of a dioxin or a PCB. And the same kind of concept happens here. You've got a ring structure, a ring structure, a five-membered ring this time with only one O that connects them and then multiple chlorines on each of these rings. Here's another one, same concept. Two rings, multiple chlorines on the ring, and they're literally just connected to each other. And then here is another type of dioxin. This is a ring with two oxygens, 
doesn't quite fit the polychlorinated biphenyl design, but it is classified as a dioxin instead. All right, so one of the most toxic um, compounds known is this thing called TCDD. TCDD stands for 2378-tetrachlorodibenzo-p-dioxin. So tetra means four. So this thing's got four chlorines on it. And the numbers tell me what carbons those are attached to. Two, three, seven, and eight. It is the most widely studied dioxin. And it is the most potent. And the reason that we talk about TCDD so much is because back in the Vietnam War, you might have heard of this thing called Agent Orange. And Agent Orange was known because it would come in orange barrels. Okay? So it's not the color of the smoke. It's not the color of the compound. These things were processed and made. And this dioxin was placed into an orange barrel that they would then ship out to the people that needed to use it. The story with uh, TCD is that in the Vietnam War, what was going on is that we were, in a way, losing. And one of the reasons that we were not doing so well is because of the significant amount of foliage that you see over in that country. Uh, bushes, trees, uh, any type of leafy plant, they would be huge. It would almost be like a rainforest in a way. And the Vietnam people would actually hide and wait in these heavily foliaged areas. And then that way when we would land or when we would make contact, uh, we couldn't quite see any of the people that were on the ground because they were covered up by basically camouflage. They would be very hard to detect and very hard to see, and they would start snopping our soldiers left and right. So one of the concepts that was brought to the table would be get rid of the camouflage. We need to go over, fight the Vietnam War, and we need to completely put a disaster to this foliage or this heavy brush that these Vietnam people would hide under. Uh, and because of that, uh, we needed something that would kill the grass, and we needed something that would kill the leaves, and we needed something that would kill the foliage. So the United States government at the time turns to a company called Monsanto. And Monsanto you probably have heard about before, especially if you're a food fanatic, because Monsanto right now is completely in charge of genetically modified organisms or crops. You know, this is the concept of if we grow a tomato, how can we make the tomato grow bigger? If we grow corn, how can we make the corn sweeter? Uh, if we grow any type of fruit or vegetable and we limit the water, or maybe I have a hard time getting water to those crops, how can we ensure that these crops will continue to grow? These are all genetically modified organisms that take place. Well, Monsanto back in the day also had a play in pesticides and herbicides. So how can we completely devastate foliage or weeds and completely kill them so that way we can now see these people a little bit better that's using it for their camouflage? So Monsanto comes up with the idea of giving us some dioxin. And the dioxin is the TCDD. So basically, they bottle up TCDD in these barrels, and they paint them orange, and we call it Agent Orange. And then throughout the war, um, these helicopters and our troops would basically spread the um, TCDD dioxin all over the area in hopes that it would kill the foliage. And it did kill the foliage. The problem, though is that after the fact, Monsanto says, oops, I made a mistake. And the mistake was 
we accidentally made this 1,000 times too high. I know that you suggested a concentration. It should only have so much because this is pretty poison. But we actually made it a thousand times too strong. Sorry. And this was after the fact. After it was used. So now Agent Orange has been spread all over Vietnam. And Agent Orange has now made its way into the water into the ground, into the air, into the people. And shortly after, we start seeing the problems with Agent Orange. And this is what we start to see. TCD has made its way into the life of the Vietnam people. Not only did it kill the life of the trees and the bushes, but it also started to kill the life of the native people that lived there. We start to see deformities happen in pregnancies. We start to see poisoning happening with the people that were living. We start to see a higher report of deaths, a higher report of illness a higher report of disabling diseases that started taking these people's lives. And this was all based on TCD, TCDD, a dioxin, one particular type of compound in a very low concentration that still had the power to wipe out not only the trees and foliage, but many of its people too. And quite honestly, TCDD is still there. And the United States government has stepped in and has began or helped begin a cleanup process because this stuff has now leached into the water and into the soil and everywhere. And there's still significantly high contamination levels in certain places of Vietnam. So, the advantages of GC. Here's another GC instrument. This one looks a little bit different. But it requires very little sample in order to run, which is good if you don't have a lot to begin with. The solution preparation is very minimal. Very often, these are very quick methods or laboratory procedures that we have to do. It takes longer to run it on the machine sometimes than it does to prep a sample. When you run a sample, very often these are 10 minutes or lower as far as runtime goes. High precision basically means it looks the same data over and over and over and over. And the instrument is kind of complicated, but the software is not. It's very easy to run and maintain at this point. So over to the right, you see a GC 2014 from Shimatsu. Uh, this is a newer instrument. We had one of these instruments in our laboratory at one point in time, uh, but we had to send it back. And the reason we had to send it back is because it did not have a UL sticker on it. And the state forced us to send it back and replace it with an older model that was UL approved. Okay. All right. So this is where I'll stop. Uh, you now know the importance of maybe PCBs and dioxins. And gas chromatography is a perfect instrument to take care of those types of scenarios. So in the next video, we'll talk a little bit about some of the data, what it looks like, before we go into more details of pieces and parts.